podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people? That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stamp here. Thanks for tuning in. Look, this week we are going deep. In fact, we're staying deep because I know our last episode was too. But look, if you're not going deep, you're not learning something new. This week on the show, we are interviewing Richard Nisbet as we talk about thinking. No, literally, his book is called Thinking. And frankly, Richard is one of the best people to talk about thinking. In fact, Malcolm Gladwell said, the most influential thinker in my life has been the psychologist Richard Nisbet. He basically gave me my view of the world. Enough said, right? So we're going to be talking about how people reason, how people should reason, and why errors in reasoning occur. Our guest, Richard, is a professor of psychology at the University of Michigan. He also taught psychology at Columbia University and Yale University. If you like what you hear, tell a friend. We've been seeing an upward trend. We're getting new listeners, so excited to have you. Keep spreading the word. Great episodes to come. Don't forget, if you're feeling generous these holidays, you can support us to five bucks a month, patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast ad-free episodes, and more. All right, let's turn it over to Richard as we talk about thinking. Enjoy. I've got your book here, Thinking, a Memoir. And I have to say, for somebody who spends a lot of time in my brain, thinking about thinking, trying to learn, it spoke to me. Tell us more about how people don't really understand what the reasoning process is. We, we can't observe. You can, uh, I, simple rule, you cannot observe your mental processes any more than you can observe your perceptual processes or your memory processes. It's just that because we have words <laughs> that to, to describe our behavior, we think that we're able to observe the cognitive process. How does that negatively impact us? Mostly, we don't get in trouble uh, by not being able to observe our cognitive processes. Really, the important thing is to have the cognitive processes and to have them be as accurate as possible. It's an extra layer of work to put on the brain to be able to examine uh, what everything that goes into a process. There, there's a, a boomlet for the last 10 or 15 years in psychology showing how easy it is to... Uh, find someone doing something for one some reason uh, and being unaware that that's it. For example, if you have somebody uh, vote uh, in a school, they're more likely to approve a millage for an increase in educational funding uh, than if you have them vote in a church. Or if someone votes in a church, they're more likely to vote against abortion than if you have them vote in a school. But if you were to ask someone, tell me, um, I, I say, how did you vote on the millage? You say, well, I voted for it. And I say, oh, that's interesting. Do you suppose that, that was, you did that in part because the vote took place in a school? They may volunteer to punch you out. I mean, <laughs> people <laughs> don't like to be asked questions that is implied that they're stupid. Uh, and actually, yeah. they're not. For somebody that know that thinks about their thinking like you do and that understands the processes are incorrect and there's bias built in, do you ever find that to be a hindrance or or does that actually excite you? Well, it's kind of an embarrassment when somebody asks me, why did you do that? And I know that the correct answer is, I don't know. <laughs> you <laughs> can't you say that. So what? The man doesn't know what the heck he's doing. No, I, I actually do go. know what I'm doing. It's just that I don't know the thinking process that made me do it. Uh, so, I mean, you do give up a sense of control by saying, oh, I don't really know everything that goes into my thinking processes, and therefore I don't really know everything that that uh, happened in my brain to produce my behavior. 
I think we're better off because it's we're spared false knowledge. Uh, we're worse off in the sense that we're you know we become less confident, uh, and uh, uh, and we can sometimes embarrass ourselves by admitting that we don't know when everybody would think we should know. It leads me to this: Do you think you have reaped the rewards of this knowledge in terms of the output, the um, the results you have gotten in life? I think it it helps to avoid situations that cause us to do things we don't want to do. If we are agnostic as to whether that situation could be propelling us in a direction that we don't want to take, uh, you're probably more likely to avoid it. Ah, so it's knowing the output without knowing the process can be helpful. I thought a way to structure this conversation would be similar to how you structured your book. Why make it a memoir? Why make it a a linear story of your life and then intersperse what you've learned throughout? Well, there were two motives, actually. One is there is this fact that I've, I've been doing research for 50 years on how people reason, but it has so many different ramifications. Are we aware of what we're uh, aware of, about what, what's going on in our heads? Uh, uh, what is, uh, if you're trying to pro- solve a problem, uh, should you just work at it, think of it as hard as you can, or should you back off uh, and let the unconscious take over for a while? Uh, studying how people make mistakes in reasoning. Uh, for a long time, when I, I did a lot of research showing that we make mistakes in reasoning, I mean, then they're sometimes pretty bad. Uh, and I used to joke, you know, not only can we not reason uh, as well as uh, we would like, uh, we're too stupid to learn how to think better. Uh, mm. And uh, at some point I said, well, I should do research on that. Uh, just prove that, you know, you can't teach these rules for reasoning. And it turns out you can. And that's the most important practical implication of my work is that uh, we can be spared a huge number of errors by learning, oh, a dozen or so categories of rule systems. Ah, okay. Here's another question. How does this line of thinking, what you were just mentioning, uh, how does it differ from the idea of biases? So, like, uh, we we make incorrect uh, assumptions about our thought processes. Is that the same as... As humans, we inherently have biases that guide our thinking and we're not aware of it, or are there differences there? Well, a lot of research has gone on by me and by many other people uh, is looking at biases and uh, uh, and looking at the kind of heuristics that we use to solve problems, some of which are just bad heuristics. Uh, to go to the, the, the interview situation that you mentioned, uh, people are usually astonished to learn that the half-hour interview, unstructured interview, let's get acquainted, let me find out about you, is useless for predicting success in college, in graduate school, in law school, in the military, uh, in business of any kind. It's, it's, it, it, it isn't literally absolutely completely worthless. The correlation between ratings of uh, prediction of how this candidate is going to do in the new situation and actual ratings of performance of the person later, that correlation is 0.10, which is not completely nothing, but it's damn near nothing. And what's really disastrous about the interview situation is that we are incapable of confining that information to to have the the, uh, loading that it... uh, that it should. It had should mm. have near load, near no use at all. But so people will treat it as if it's highly informative, and you know, bet the bet the ranch that this guy is the guy for the job on the basis of a thirty-minute interview, which is practically worthless. Ah, I see. So it's almost the overconfidence in, uh, and I'm sure this relates to a lot of things. Maybe it's the overconfidence. It's just the confidence in the outcome you get to in your mind. Um, oftentimes, it's just so far removed, yet as humans, we are conditioned to be confident in that decision. Right. And it helps. Here's, here's how can we avoid that? How can, you, how can you be made to believe what I've just been saying about interviews? 
uh, you can say to people, you know, when you interview somebody, you have the hallucination uh, that uh, you've got a, a hologram. You're seeing the person, a smaller and a little not completely clear, but it's a hologram. It's not a hologram. It's a few pieces of evidence uh, and not very damn many pieces of evidence. And is there anything you could do better? Well, if you're interviewing a cocktail waitress, uh, no, probably. You know, is she charming? Is she pleasant? That's about all you need to know. But often, in the case of college admissions, in the case of uh, business uh, appointments, you can know vastly more than you could possibly get from an interview, from the folder. I mean, the information is there in the folder. It's the, it's the, the GPA, uh, the quality of, uh, of work that you may be able to see in terms of work samples or letters of recommendation from people. This is all a huge amount of evidence, and, and you, if you use it properly, if you use the evidence available to you from a college admission folder properly, uh, it will it will give you a 0.4 to 0.5 correlation with actual performance later. Well, that's huge. Mm. That's that, yeah. that's just enormously better than than a stab in the dark. I want to get into that, but I I have to start. You know, you were talking about you've been doing this for 50 years, etc. And right off the bat, when you're talking about your childhood, I've got two little kids, so. Uh, and and you think about thinking for so long. I'm curious because I know you have some thoughts on just raising children and parenting in general uh, and how we can use our thinking um, to do that better. Now, right off the bat, there's a sentence you say, my lone wanderings were critical to my development. Uh, you talk about how you grew up, you know, near cotton farms and it was very rural and, and a lot of time spent in your own mind. Um, my question is, how much of our personality or, or our thought process, do you think, is shaped by the environment? And then, so for example, can you take an extroverted, maybe uh, athletically focused kid, put them in perhaps your upbringing, maybe it's more rural, it's more isolated, and create somebody who prefers more of the introverted ideals? Actually, you know, that's an extremely interesting question. I've never thought about it. Uh, what, what do I think now that you've uh, asked me to do it? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I just ah, don't. you're not allowed to say that. We just talked about that. No, I know, no, it's I know. Fair. It's, it's illegal. It's a, that's the no, last no, no. one I'll use. No, no, it's totally fair. The reason I asked, though, is because as you were talking about that, right, you were talking about uh, the time spent alone and you used your unconscious mind, and then what you have turned out to spend your life on, I just found really interesting. Uh, I was like, oh, I wonder if he was raised in a city, constantly bombarded with stimulus, would he have had the time to develop this thought process that would have led to scientific line of thinking? Didn't know if you'd ever thought about it. <laughs> well, I do. You know, here here is a thought that I have about the line of questioning. Um, I think that the new electronic world that we live in is a disaster from the standpoint of it doesn't encourage sitting, looking into the, the distance and thinking. Uh, it's sort of constantly giving us a reason not to think. I mean, to absorb, yes, and we do thinking anyway, I mean, it, in the cracks. But uh, I do think that uh, the iPhone makes us stupid in some ways uh, because we, aren't, we don't have the time, we haven't allowed ourselves the time uh, to think through problems. Uh, that because there's always something else to be doing. That is that is true. It reminds me of something else to be doing. Uh, this might be off subject. You might be going, I was not expecting this, but you also mentioned how like at eight years old, uh, you would jump into a river, but you didn't really know how to swim and you would float. Uh, you'd take a bus into town. And then you say, I asked my, I think it was mom, why would you let me do that? And she said, well, we didn't know like bad outcomes could happen. And the reason I'm asking you this is how much you know about thinking, and I'm a parent, so that, that's why I'm asking. But, like, how much of the way we raise kids today do you think is different simply because of information availability? And do you think it's valid, or do you think it's a bias because we see it on the news and we're driven by fear? Well, I, th I think it's just a disaster that stuff gets reported uh, in the news. I think there's every reason to assume that— uh, 
people are more likely to do some awful thing if they've heard that it's being done. I mean, that's just that's just the way we're constructed. That we, uh, and so I think there's a, a tremendous loss there. I can't prove that. Uh, sure. But I, I, it's what I believe. Uh, but I know for a fact, I mean, the tremendous number of things are lost because, I mean, kids are not able to do things by themselves. My mother was once in, standing in her yard, and there are two pretty little girls come by, uh, and my mother says hi to them. And they, they get rigid and grab one another's hands. I mean, they're terrified. They don't ever speak to strangers. I mean, uh -huh. that's sad. Uh, right. And it's you know it's sad that kids can't do what I used to do. I mean, uh, was I was was there some risk involved in me going to downtown El Paso and hanging out in the in the South El Paso where all the pinball machines were? Maybe there was a risk there, but it was these were I had experiences that are valuable to me. And that's what I, I was so striking early on in your book. Again, having young kids, I. You talk about how, you know, I think it was age 10, you jumped off the roof, you tore your ACL, right? And I realized, so we were talking about getting a trampoline. And I'm like, ah, we can't get one. You know, and of course I Google it, how healthy are they and all this stuff. And it, the first article that pops up is like one of the number one reasons kids go to hospitals is because of trampolines. And I'm like, we can't have one. But why I say that is, all right, let's take you for example all the things you did, and I'm sure there's more, but all the things you did, and maybe one of the worst things that happened is you tore your ACL. Of course, that's not a good thing, but the sum of the whole, is it worth that cost? Um, one, I would, I would put that question to you. Um, and again, the reason I'm asking is because I'm curious about uh, somebody who thinks through things so much, you know, how you, how you an analyze something like that. Well, first of all, let's point out that uh, my mother would have thought, who was at home nearly all every day, would have thought, what could go wrong? He's here at home. <laughs> ah. What could go wrong is that the idiot would climb up to the roof and then jump off of it to show that he could. Yeah. I mean, right. not to show anybody right. else, just to show himself uh, that he could do that. Uh, so um, my, my mother would have had no idea that she was that a, a risk was present there that her idiot son would jump off the roof. Yeah. But she was certainly able to prevent him from doing things that uh, that were valuable to him. Uh, and fortunately, she didn't know the risks involved, which were near zero, I'm sure, but not literally zero. Like I mentioned, that's how you started the book, and you kind of go through there. You mentioned you are a high self monitor. And I was, I don't know if people have heard it phrased that way, but I know a lot of people who feel that way. So I was curious, define that for us. And how does it show up for you? And what's its impact? Uh, well, the, the book, of course, has an anecdote, which I love that I, uh, which shows my uh, self-monitoring tendency. I had my friends, my high school chums, and I was a certain way with them. I mean, devil may care, cynical, and so on. And uh, uh, my girlfriend, who I was uh, behaved in ways that I thought were romantic, uh, which were not being cynical, but being uh, uh, amusing and and uh, pleasant and uh, uh, and soulful. <laughs> uh, and then there were my parents, and these three groups of people see me off at the railroad station as I'm going off to college. And uh, they don't know how to respond to each other. They don't know how to respond to me because I'm not, I'm trying to not behave, <laughs> trying to right. just be a total blank. Because if I, any way I behave is going to be a way that the, one of these or more of these people are, are, are going to wonder why they haven't, well, hello, who is this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's that's the kind of trouble you can get in being a, a, a high self monitor that you have to keep in mind an audience. And when audiences get fused uh, you know, without your knowledge, then uh, your self monitoring and your tendency to behave in ways that they expect uh, get you in trouble. Hey, everyone, Chris here. And I want to take a minute for our sponsor this week, Organifi. 
Now, the one thing you might be asking is, why is Chris doing the read? Because honestly, John almost always does these. When Organifi decided to sponsor the show and I got their product, I tried it and I was genuinely shocked. I actually called John and said, hey, let me do the ad read for this one because it's incredible. And here's why. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition with high quality ingredients and less than three grams of sugar. So my two favorites are their green juice blend and their gold blend. The green juice blend is best with cold, you know, just mix it with cold water. It has all types of good stuff. It has ashwagandha, which if you're not familiar, it's a adaptogen that can help with stress, weight management, etc. It has moringa, matcha, chlorella, spirulina. It has all this good stuff, but what's even crazier is it's delicious. Like my biggest problem with a lot of these products is they taste like they're healthy. This stuff is awesome. And the gold, oh man, you put it in hot water like a tea. It has turmeric, ginger, lemon balm, reishi mushroom, turkey tail mushroom. Again, made of health, but like better than all the teas I have on a nightly basis. So treat yourself to amazing health and try it today for 20% off your entire purchase. Go to www.organifi.com slash smart. Again, organifi.com slash smart. Get 20% off. And when you love it, shoot me an email and tell me I was right. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, I've always called it just being a chameleon. Like, you can put me anywhere and I can figure out, for better or worse, what does this other group need that I can give to create the bond or the output or the result. Uh, I feel like that's how I got through a lot of school. It was pretty easy for me to listen to any professor or teacher, lecture or whatever it is, and know, all right, these are the things they, they value. Uh, these are the things we're gonna be tested on. These are the things I can drop. Uh, so it was always kind of a game to me. And I think it's helped at the cost of sometimes just saying, who am I in reality, like despite the audience and just be that person and let them decide the outcome. And it can be exhausting. Right. Yeah, it is. I do know people who are not self monitors They absolutely are this. They are who they are in every situation. And I, I have to say, well, that's an advantage because I trust these people more than I do us self monitors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, but it can be a disadvantage too. I mean, you can be a little bit clueless if you don't yeah. self-monitor enough. I remember the first time I found out that not everybody did that. I literally remember it. I was like, wait, 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 wait. You don't think about like who you are and then who they are and how you're acting and how they might perceive it and like all this at the same time. I, I was blown away by that. One of the reasons I wanted to bring this up with you is what does that say about our thinking, self-monitor or not, to, to run it through your scientific lens? Is it we are analyzing our actions as we go? And are we able to analyze our own behaviors and others' response to that behaviors accurately? That, that, this brings up another kind of personality trait, which is, although I'm a high self-monitor, I'm not necessarily good at judging other people's reactions to me because, because frankly, I'm often not paying attention. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm on the stage here, you know, uh, look at me, look at me, and I'm not paying that much attention. It wasn't until late in life uh, when I began studying uh, East Asian behavior and thought uh, that I realized East Asians are doing something that Westerners don't do as much of. That is, they are paying attention to the context. They're constantly aware of things in the context that they're living in at the moment that Westerners are not. Uh, and I started monitoring less myself and monitoring more other people's reaction. And I did become more effective uh, in groups once I started you know, having my antennae out and figuring out how, to, how are people responding to what I'm suggesting here. That's actually something I wanted to touch on, and I appreciate you going there, which is you talked about how cultures monitor differently, right? How they reason differently. I found it fascinating how you said they reason differently 
and many do it better than Western cultures. This show is global, so different things. I'd love to know kind of how you group cultures and their reasoning, and then what you have found to be perhaps the better way to approach reasoning from a cultural perspective. Well, uh, let me talk first about the advantages of Western thought, which began with the ancient Greeks, uh, who gave us formal logic uh, and rule-based analysis of the environment, uh, the importance of categorizing things so that we know what rules to apply to that category of thing. That habit of mind, uh, which is, has been characteristic of the West, ever since, and it has, I believe, everything to do with why it is that science was invented in the West, actually by the Greeks, uh, and because uh, science just is rules about categories. That's what it is. Uh, now, that, uh, that type of reasoning comes more easily to Westerners. Uh, what is the advantage of, of East Asian thought? Well, they're paying attention to the context much better than we are. And uh, this shows up, believe it or not, in uh, actual perception. Uh, in a study that Takahito Masuda and I did, we showed uh, Japanese uh, students and University of Michigan students underwater scenes. And then do that, run that for 20 seconds, and then we did say, tell me, what did you see? The Americans say, well, I saw three big fish swimming off to the left. They had white bellies, and they had one fin on their back. The Japanese says, I saw what looked like a stream. The water was green. There were rocks and shells on the bottom. There were three big fish swimming off to the left. They always start with the context. I mean, it's actually built into the language. I mean, uh, uh, they don't... If you would, they ask, somebody ask you, what did you do for your vacation? An American will say, well, I went skiing at so-and-so. If you ask a Japanese what they did, this is, well, at Mount so-and-so, I went skiing. I wow. Mean, they, let's, let's establish the context. All of that is, is uh, well, okay, so what, does it make a difference? It makes a hell of a difference because uh, on these little fish tank things uh, that we did, they pick up. 60% uh, more relationships, uh, like, you know, the frog was on the leaf, uh, than the Americans do. And they pick up uh, vastly more information about the context, literally twice as much information. And, and this is at no cost. They, they, you know, and they oh. learn just as much about the central things that are going on as the Americans do, but they're getting all the rest as well. So that's huge. And, and this is true. This is just one, it's almost like just a metaphor for the whole attention to context uh, and holistic thinking that's characteristic of East Asians. Uh, and, uh, you know, they have no trouble learning our tricks, categorization, rules, formal logic. That's no trouble. Uh, we, I don't know how to, I have no idea how to teach Americans to be more sensitive to context in general, more sensitive to relationship between the context uh, and the humans or animals or objects that are, that are in that context. Uh, maybe you can teach it. I don't, I don't know, but, but it's, it's a huge advantage. They learn our tricks easily. I'm not sure that we can learn their tricks very well. No, I, I love that. And I want to stay here for a minute just so we can clarify. What do you think the most valuable benefit of being able to see the context is, especially when it comes at no cost, which I think is critical there? Right. Well, let me tell you about a f very famous old experiment in social psychology. So social psychology. You have somebody, usually a college student, read an essay that was written by another student, which is let's say, in favor of legalization of marijuana. That was a topic 55 mm -hmm. years ago. still is in some contexts wow. today. Uh, and uh, you tell him he was assigned to write that essay in a political science class, or he was assigned that position in a debate 
And that's why any one of them would write this essay out that would be the basis of his debate points. Um, or it was told by a psychology experiment, I would like you to give a little, to write an essay in favor of legalization of marijuana. Uh, and now you ask subjects, well, what do you, how do you suppose this guy really feels about it? And the answer is, oh, I'm sure he's in favor of legalization of marijuana. <laughs> I just heard him say that. Uh, now, uh, it's such a powerful thing. If you hear me say something, you assume that it's what I believe. But it, and it, it, we don't, we, that's illogical in this situation because the person was required to do it. Now, we know that Koreans, any, I'm sure, East Asians in general, but certainly Koreans, because we've done this exact experiment uh, in Korea, and uh, uh, they make the same mistake. Koreans make the same mistake. They, they, they assume that they've learned what the guy's actual attitudes are. But if we first put people in that situation themselves, have them, you know, write about uh, whether we should have uh, foreign policy should involve uh, a preference for nation building or whatever, and and we require them. The psychologist says, "I want you to give a speech in favor. I want you to write an essay uh, in, uh, in favor of that position." Uh, and then you put them through this situation where they watch somebody else. The Koreans say, I haven't learned anything about that guy's opinion. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, that's huge. I mean, to be able to recognize what's going on in a situation, to incorporate it into your understanding of what's producing other people's behavior by being able to observe your own behavior in that situation. So that's, that's a big advantage. Yes, that that's really impactful, too. I could see that because, you know, I, I like to consider myself good at thinking just given or understanding, especially given what I do. But I often take a book at its cover. And to your point, how often do we even consider the background and then the fact that it's cultural? And what I love about what you said, again, is that it doesn't come at a cost. That was where initially I was like, yeah, but. What do they miss? And essentially, if they're not missing more in a world that is increasingly more complex, where uh, context is going to be more and more impactful in the outcome, what a kind of a, 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 an interesting way to break up reasoning simply by culture and how you were raised. Right. One of my favorite stories along these lines is it was actually comes from this, stu this student, Takahito Masuda. Uh, said I mean, if you've ever have you ever been in uh, Tokyo uh, or by any chance or uh, no I wish you you you've seen pictures of it, it, it yeah it's a jumble to us I mean there's signs on top of signs on top yeah. I mean it's just I mean they're bewildering uh, yeah and uh, he said that after when he came to the US for the first time he found it very depressing because there weren't enough things <laughs> to be seen. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we found that if we, uh, if we uh, primed people with these highly complex Americans, with these highly complex scenes, they were more likely to pick up things in new novel scenes uh, that they encountered. We just primed them with complex uh, scenes. So that's an excellent example of how, you know, just how our reasoning can be not only structured, but how it can be right or wrong. First, what is your clearest way of explaining how people reason in the first place? Well, gee, that would be hard for me to describe because there's so many different ways that we that we reason. Uh, I can take, you know, any number of concrete kinds of reasoning that uh, people use. I mean, just take this example of this experiment of uh, where you have people look at someone else give a speech or you look at an essay that they've written. The reasoning goes, this person probably uh, believes what he's saying. Uh, a Korean who's seen this, who's been exposed to that situation himself, in includes in the reasoning I did X because I was told to do X. This guy's doing Y I'm because he was told to do Y. So it's it's just uh, we uh, 
apply our understanding of social situations, the rules that we have for understanding particular social situations, uh, to a social problem, and we apply rules having to do with mechanics to mechanical problems. Um, so it can be very difficult to find out, you know, exactly what goes on uh, through people's heads uh, when they uh, when they're uh, planning some behavior. What and it, 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 you you can often you know how people solve arithmetic problems because they got the rules for arithmetic and they you give them a situation and they and they apply it. Other times it's not so clear to the psychologist what the rules are in that situation. You have to put people in that situation and tamper with it before you can see what rules they're using to think about it. I think the biggest question I'm sure you get this all the time is, look, I'm a human. Uh, so much of what I do, we don't understand yet, or it's not fully explained, but I want to be better. And and I know a lot of your studies and, and you know, experiments and everything have been focused on understanding it, but also what then can we do with it? How can we improve our reasoning and how can we uh, get better results from reasoning better? My favorite example of how you can change people's reasoning for the better in a matter of minutes is uh, how to uh, avoid the sunk cost problem, mm. about being a, a sucker for the sunk cost. Um, and I, a simple anecdote is, a, you know, is enough to give people a tool uh, to use. Suppose uh, you know, there's a, a basketball game you bought tickets for it uh, a month ago, uh, but tonight's the night of the game and the star isn't playing and it started to snow uh, and am, are you, am I going to drive 45 minutes? Uh, and if the answer to that question that you ask yourself, shall I go, is, well, I don't want to waste the money. You know, honk, wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can't waste the money. That money's gone. No longer, no longer wasteable. Uh, so, um, uh, and this is uh, just a very general thing. I mean, uh, the first way I learned this, another kind of anecdote that helps people understand the concept of sunk cost. The first study that I did in graduate school didn't work out. I mean, my advisor looked over the data and he talked to me about it. He said, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, kiddo. You know, you, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You're losing on this one. And that was unacceptable to me. I mean, my God, I've spent months on this thing. So I go out and so redo it. Uh, and I analyzed the data even more, and I wasted another couple of three months on the thing because it, it, it didn't work the first time, a good indication that it's not going to work the second time right. either. Uh, and uh, so, um, you know, that's when I learned, you know, that you, you can't save sunk time uh, by putting in more time. You can just, and you can't, uh, if you paid tickets for a movie and you're watching it and it's, it seems utterly boring or objectionable, uh, you don't uh, think to yourself, "Gee, I you know I could leave, but you know I've I paid for the movie already, so I'll be there." So, well, that's my my answer to that is, well, that's paying twice, once for the ticket and once for the tedium. <laughs> this week's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. Let's pretend for a moment that you're about to launch a campaign. It tested well. Your entire team is happy. Everything is going according to plan. Except for that one thought in the back of your head. How do I ensure the people I want to target will be in the mindset to receive my message? The answer? LinkedIn. Because when you market on LinkedIn, your message reaches people who are ready to engage with your business. And that means your advertising campaign will work as hard as it can as soon as you launch it. Over 62 million decision makers are on LinkedIn, and they're thinking about their business. It's one of the many reasons more than 78% of B2B marketers rate LinkedIn as the most effective social media platform at helping their organization achieve specific objectives. For me, LinkedIn is the first place I look when I want to find information on the podcast industry. There's been a handful of articles or ads that I've come across that have really shaped the way that Smart People Podcast is moving. 
LinkedIn can help you reach your short and long-term business goals. They offer tools for brand building and lead generation. Not only can you target and reach a professional audience down to their job title, company name, and location, but you can engage people you already know based on who's visited your site or who you've contacted in the past. You can even customize your campaign based on the action you want your customers to take and objectives you want to achieve. Advertising on LinkedIn, the world's largest professional network, can help you reach your marketing goals. Do business where business is done. Get a $100 advertising credit toward your first LinkedIn campaign. Visit linkedin.com slash smart. One more time, that's linkedin.com slash smart. Terms and conditions apply. And now back to the episode. You know what this is reminding me of? I, I, I like going through it. A lot of people have heard of the sunk cost fallacy, but then using it to talk about reasoning, I think sometimes these tangible things we've heard separate from something that seems intangible, such as reasoning. And I'll give an example. Uh, I'm the type of person who used to believe that if I think something is not going to go my way, let's say there's a one in a hundred chance that I get a job that I really want. There's an example. I would spend more time up front imagining the likelihood is I don't get it. Here's what that's going to feel like. Kind of preparing myself for the, uh, the negative impact. Until I read, it's been proven that people who don't do that, okay, people who just try it and leave the results to, to be, are happier than those who don't. And the reason is, if you are pre constantly preparing yourself for the negative, you're experiencing it more than you need to. You're experiencing when you prepare for it, and you're experiencing it if and when it actually happens. And the biggest thing I remembered is just by preparing for it did not make it any less negative. And that was the kicker for me. Why do I bring that up? These rules you mentioned, there's 12 essentially, I think you said, or these ideas uh, are things we can actually do and change our human experience, change the way we live and the way we experience this life. I think that's where the power comes. Do you find that to be the the benefit of your work is like you can use this and actually live a better life because of it. Absolutely. I mean, if, if you know the law of large numbers, which is more evidence is better than less evidence, and you have developed the habit of thinking, do I have enough evidence for this decision I'm about to make? And knowing that that depends on how variable the events of li like that are. That's abstractly stated. Let me give you a concrete example of what I, of what I mean. Uh, in my mid-20s, uh, I went to uh, Europe for the first time. I spent 10 days in London. Had a wonderful time. The sky was blue every day. It was sunny. And I came away sort of vaguely thinking that the English are really complainers. You know, I, <laughs> the weather is perfectly lovely there. Uh, and my punishment was the next time I went to London for a week, it never stopped raining the <laughs> entire time. Now, uh, was I stupid enough to think that it's not variable there? I mean, it, 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 no, I'm not. But I didn't, nobody was standing next to me while I was thinking the English are kind of... Uh, uh, complainers. Nobody was standing next to me saying, how, how much evidence is this exactly uh, for the kind of conclusion you're drawing? And, you know, if, if, if you'd asked me that question, I'd say, God, that's not much evidence at all, is it? Because weather is the kind of thing that's extremely variable. Right. Uh, so, uh, but you can enhance people's understanding of the law of large numbers by examples like this. You can get them to the point where they will be able to think about an interview as a small amount of information, certainly small in relation to the amount of evidence that they could get by just, you know, collecting it or looking at the folder. It's a great point. And the analogies of the stories work so well to explain these concepts and they stick with us longer. I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I, I have to talk about this one, which is 
the problems that we best solve using our conscious and our unconscious mind. Talk to us a little bit about number one, you know, how did you go about even studying that? Like, like what made you wonder that question? And then where did you come out? What, what, what's the answer there? Well, uh, one very early influence on me was reading a book by a man named uh, Brewster Gieselin, that's spelled G-H. Uh, and it was a, a, a book of essays written by famous people who've done brilliant work in physics or mathematics or literature. Uh, and he's asked, and the, they're talking about how they did it. And Gieselin says, Virtually every single person tells you that the key idea they had, they weren't even thinking consciously about it when it popped into their head. For example, uh, the poet Amy Lowell says, you know, I was once, uh, I was in a, a, an art store and I saw uh, a uh, bronze statue of horses. And she said, it crossed her mind the bronze horses would be a nice idea maybe for a poem sometime. Six months later, she sits down and starts writing out a poem about the bronze horses without having consciously thought about bronze horses at all in the intervening six months. Or Poincaré, who says, you know, I, the, the idea of how to solve the, the particular functions I was looking at uh, came to him as he put his foot on the bus. He was on vacation. He put his foot on the step on the bus and suddenly realized, oh my God, these are the, the appropriate equations are the ones I've already worked out for another problem. Uh, and nothing had prepared him for that. So, so, so okay, we're not all <laughs> great thinkers. Uh, we're not all Amy Lowell's and Poincaré's. But we all have problems to solve. And uh, my example of how I use it myself is uh, in generating thought questions for for a seminar. If I wait until just before the seminar to to write questions for next week's seminar, they're not going to be very good. If I sit down four or five days in advance, I re refresh my memory of what it is we're going to be talking about, just like two or three minutes. Uh, then I sit down, you know, the day I actually have to produce them, and they just start pouring into my head. I mean, it's, it's somebody else did the work. Yeah. They're so much better than what I would have done. Or a friend of mine used to, uh, in calculus class, he'd just get stumped on a problem, and he learned, don't just keep working on it. Uh, go to sleep. <laughs> Wake up in the morning, and, and the solution may be there. So... Uh, one of my favorite questions right now is, is what kinds of problems are best solved by the conscious mind <coughs> and what kinds are best solved by the unconscious mind? And a surprising range of problems, you're better off uh, not doing a conscious deliberate process about. So you can give people descriptions of, of two apartments. They're complex descriptions, lots of information. And you know which is going to be the better apartment, which is, you know, that's going to be the one that people report uh, liking uh, better if they, if they live there. And, and you also know what will be the answer that people will come to after they've really thought about it in a very conscious way as well as an unconscious way. But if, <clears throat> if you just give that pe people the information about the apartments very rapidly, so that they don't actually have time to sit down and weigh it. I mean, do a cost, formal cost-benefit analysis. Their judgments are better than if you uh, sit them down and have them think about it in a conscious way. Um, so, which is, yeah, it's a real surprise. I, 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 although I'm a fan of the unconscious mind, I did not predict that the re that result for that experiment. So. You know some things. And Ma Malcolm Gladwell has written, you know, on this on this topic of uh, uh, what kinds of judgments or snap judgments uh, are correct. There's no no not remotely enough time to do the formal analysis. You just got to make that guess, and, 
And that's done uh, unconsciously. When we just know something immediately, that isn't because we've done a thorough consideration of all the elements of the problem. It's just that that's being done by the unconscious mind, which is more rapid and more holistic than the analytic uh, conscious mind. Do you have any rubric, maybe, or way of, of thinking, hey, this is something for the conscious, or this is something better for the unconscious? And what I mean by that is, you know, I could see a bunch of people hearing this going, great, I, I'll, I'll trust it, I'll try it, but when do I know to step away and just hope an answer comes? Actually, I, I don't have rules about that. And, and that's why I say the, the question that I'm, I'm most interested in right now is what kinds of problems are better solved uh, unconsciously. Now, a lot of decisions, I, I, I will say this, a lot of decisions really deserve a full-dress cost-benefit analysis, thinking explicitly about every element of the problem and uh, and then choosing the thing that comes out uh, that w weighted the best. Uh, but uh, some things, uh, you're not going to get it that quickly. I mean, they, you need to think about it for a while. You need to let it stew. Let, let the, give the, pass it on to the unconscious and let the unconscious. Now you can have two frames of reference. One is the conscious decision. The other is the unconscious decision that you come to <coughs> after standing away from the problem for a while and letting the unconscious work. Yeah, I think the takeaway for me there is value both. I overvalue the conscious, overvalue the ability to grind and process. But what I do know, especially after 400 plus hours of these conversations alone, is deep in the, in the back somewhere of that brain, there are more creative solutions probably than the front conscious piece and to trust that a little bit. Have you ever looked into or thought about the origin of consciousness? Where did the need for consciousness and reasoning come from? Or have you kind of just assumed we need it and now how does it work? And if so, what did you draw on? Okay, this is another great question. Um, I, I, I do think about that a lot. Um, it's, yeah, why do we have a conscious mind? I'm saying, we don't. We can't really observe our conscious. We can't observe even our conscious mind. We don't know what's what's going on in our uh, in, in our consciousness. It's all or most of it is hidden from us. But there is a lot of stuff that we're conscious about. I have I have a dog, a little <laughs> Norwich Terrier, uh, and she's getting on in years, and there are steps that she sometimes needs to go down, and she needs to jump down it. And she now, she gets to a situation and I can see what's going on in her head. She's saying, can I do this? Is this safe or not? And uh, <laughs> she's not using words, that's for sure. Uh, is it a conscious calculation? Does she, does she know that she's, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know whether uh, animals have consciousness at the same level that we do. Uh, and uh, I don't know why we, I can't tell you why we started having, if, if in fact it's a novel uh, solution uh, for human beings, I, I can't tell you, you know, what, what prompted that, what kind of thing was operating in evolution to make that effective. I've seen similar things in my dog, right? And, and maybe it's not that exact one, but I don't think I've ever paused to think, is it conscious or not? I think I've assumed it's conscious because I assume a lot of things are like me. I think that's one of the scariest realizations as you mature is understanding how unlike you, others, humans, animals, whatever are particularly human. So it's interesting to think about that. I would look at my dog and say, yes, yeah, she's rationalizing or, uh, well, that's four feet down and I'm old and, but, but maybe it's, it is just as simple as a fish who's flopping around out of water. I don't think that's conscious. That So it, I like that. It's a great analogy, although I was hoping you'd have an answer for me. <laughs> no. Stay tuned. No. I love it. I love it. Well, Richard, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, again, the book is Thinking a Memoir. My last question, and then I want you to tell us where to find you, is this. Your career spans 50 years. I mean, all the big institutions at Yale and Harvard and all these places, and you've worked with all these people. 
what, it, what is your biggest takeaway about the way we work throughout all of your years, the way we think, the way we rationalize? Like if you were to say, this is the thing that I have clung to or I, is, is, is always front of mind that I've learned, what would that be that you would pass on to others? Well, there are two. One is this idea of uh, let the unconscious mind do some work for you for free. That's one. The other is, and this you referred to this in the start of your question here, uh, I've, I spend a huge amount of time talking to other people. I mean, it's fun, uh, and but it the payoff is enormous. If, you, if you're at a place like Michigan, which is full of smart, interesting people, uh, uh, you'll just be getting different perspectives all the time on things that you're thinking about. Uh, I, Throughout my career, I would join seminars or start seminars, faculty seminars, all some, some were faculty student uh, seminars. Uh, I think a lot of people don't, oh, you know, I've, I've got to get this article written or I've got to get to prepare for this class, and they don't do that. Uh, but I think it's a mistake. I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge asset. I mean, I really, I literally think of, of, of the, many of the people I've known as being sort of extra brains. Wow. <laughs> I mean, so. Yeah. Just as a side note there, as an aside, we interviewed somebody and, uh, the title of the book is Thinking Outside Your Brain. And that one really stuck with me because it's kind of what you're talking about. It's, uh, she is a, a a brilliant brain scientist, and it's based in studies. It's not just a theory of how we can actually outsource our thinking or think differently. So in the physical world, it's just reminding me of this because one, use your unconscious. Like that's in your brain, but it's a different way. Or like you were saying, use the collective knowledge of the whole. Uh, it's a way of thinking outside of yourself. Uh, this podcast is that. I mean, that that is 100%. It's like, how do I leverage? I know I'll never be able to have your life, your experiences, your knowledge. I won't. But maybe in an hour, either consciously or subconsciously, along the lines, it will shape who I am. And so I'm I'm right on board with you on that. I think it's, uh, you know, we live in a unique time to be able to do that. Well, again, Richard, really appreciate it. As I mentioned, everybody, the book is Thinking, a memoir. I read it. I love it. It's it's an easy read, like as in you don't have to struggle through it, uh, I think because of the narrative nature, the story nature, uh, but a lot of great learnings there. Richard, anywhere else are, you know, you'd like our listeners to go find you? Obviously, we'll link to the book, but other places you write or you speak or anything like that. Well, there is a, a lot of stuff on my website, which is just richardnisbet.com. Um and there are several uh, lectures I've given there. The other thing is I wrote a book that uh, is all about how you can get smarter by uh, thinking ab about things in different ways, using formal rules for problems you don't think of. So that there's a book called Mindware. But there's also uh, a MOOC, uh, Massively Online uh, course, uh, which is about... 10 or 12 hours of things which are trying to distill uh, some of the things that are in that book. And that, uh, if I, I brag on myself here a bit and say that's gotten really great reviews. I mean, people really, they enjoy it, uh, <laughs> which is good because let me tell you, prepare. if you've never done a MOOC, oh my God, it's just, uh, it's not like a, a, a lecture in class. You can't... Uh, you can't say, well, the next for next week we'll be doing chapter two. The oh no, no, sorry, it's chapter three next week. Um, <laughs> it's got to be smooth as butter, <clears throat> and it can't be a talking head for for, for forty five minutes. People they won't do it. That's why nearly all MOOCs people stay with them for a little while and then leave. So I have pictures and diagrams, and I have little videos and so on uh, to make it palatable, but oh Lord, doing it was just... <laughs> I, I find it similar to writing a book, uh, so I've at least heard it and vaguely experienced. So it's never easy. That's why I appreciate the hard work that goes into it. Uh, well, we'll definitely link to all of those. And uh, Richard, I really appreciate you being on. That was our interview with Richard Nisbet. As a reminder, his book, Thinking, a Memoir, can be found wherever books are sold. 
If you enjoy the podcast and the hundreds and hundreds of episodes that we've put out, please consider supporting us over at Patreon. Head over to patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast and sign up to become a monthly patron. And if you'd ever like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. And of course, if you want to stay up to date with all things Smart People Podcast, head over to the website smartpeoplepodcast.com and sign up for the newsletter. All right, that's it for us this week. For our U.S. friends, we hope that you have a fantastic Thanksgiving on Thursday. For everybody else out there, we hope you have just as equally of an awesome Thursday and rest of the week. Make sure you stay tuned because we've got a lot of great interviews coming up. So we'll see you all next episode.